we, we should get started. We have a lot on our plate today. A few months ago, UN AIDS, the World Food Program, the ILO and other UN organizations organized a conference to discuss the latest developments in HIV sensitive social protection. Um, and it was so inspiring, we thought we'd organize a follow-up webinar to look at the state of the evidence and practice, um, and in particular, to look at the work that some innovative researchers and programmers are doing to ensure that no one is left behind, and to look at some of the new thinking on what is being called epidemiologically smart social protection. Um, how can we learn from the lessons of this COVID crisis and ensure that we have a more responsive and more effective social protection system um, for a whole range of shocks, including epidemiological shocks. Um, so uh, we're gonna lead off the panel with Dr. Tia Palermo, who's currently an associate professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Environmental Health at the University of Buffalo. Her research is looking at the impacts of social policy on population health. Um, she's just returned from Tanzania, where she's the co-principal investigator of studies, um, as well as in Ethiopia, examining the impacts of government social protection programs linked with other services and complementary interventions on health and well-being. And you'll see this is going to be a major theme in our webinar today, these linkages of services and complementary interventions and integration with social protection is vital, not only for the combination treatment that ensures effectiveness, but for a whole range of developmental impacts that are so powerful in providing preventive approaches to HIV infection. Um, Tia was a social policy manager with UNICEF Innocenti, where she led research on the impacts of social protection on child and adolescent well being in sub Saharan Africa and was actively engaged in facilitating evidence uptake in government decision making. This is the crucial link in making this evidence effective. Um, she's also worked at international NGOs. Um, and on issues related to sexual and reproductive health globally. Um, Tia, we're handing over to you for the lead off session. Thank you so much. Good afternoon and good morning, everyone. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about social protection and am I sharing the right screen? Swap displays maybe? Um, Can you see, see my regular slides? Great. That works beautifully. Okay, perfect. Okay, great. Thank you. So poverty, food insecurity, and economic shocks such as drought, flood, pandemics, and other shocks um, can lead to behaviors that we refer to as negative coping strategies. These can include migration, loans for consumption or other basic needs, reduced expenditures on health and education or selling off assets and land, sending children to work instead of to school or engaging in transactional sex or other risky behaviors. All of these in turn can lead to a disinvestment in human capital, including health and education, reduced income in the present time, but also in the future, and in turn reduced ability to deal with future shocks. These coping strategies may be gendered. So for example, boys may be more likely to be sent into hazardous work. Girls may be more likely to be married off earlier, to engage in transactional sex or age disparate relationships. And both boys and girls may be taken out of school or experience reduced investment in health. And the gendered risks of these may depend on the context. In addition to these negative coping strategies, increased stress from poverty and economic shocks can lead to increases in intimate partner violence, which have adverse health and economic repercussions, as well as intergenerational impacts, whereby we know that children 
who live in households where intimate partner violence is experienced are more likely in adulthood to go on to experience and perpetrate intimate partner violence themselves. Increased stress from poverty has also been shown to cause a dysregulation of the immune system, leading to earlier onset of chronic disease, including cardiovascular disease. Many of these adverse coping strategies are associated with an increased risk of HIV. These include lower schooling attainment, transactional sex, and intimate partner violence. Early marriage may also be associated with HIV risk. However, the link between the two has been called into question. But we know that early marriage is an adverse coping strategy of poverty and economic shocks. In addition, food insecurity is associated with suboptimal ART adherence. So in summary, negative coping strategies caused by poverty and economic shocks are associated with risk factors for HIV, and many of these risks and coping strategies are gendered. So what is social protection's role in mitigating these risks? Social protection can reduce risks, factors, and negative coping strategies, particularly when social protection programs pay attention to gender and vulnerable populations, such as people living with HIV. One form of a popular non-contributory social protection program are cash transfers. Cash transfers can include things such as social pensions, family and child benefits, universal basic income, and others. They can be mobile payments or manual cash payments, and these programs are a growing share of social safety nets globally, particularly in Africa and other lower and middle income countries. Cash transfers are pro-poor, so they reach a larger share of the poorest populations in countries. And the rise of the popularity of cash transfers is based on demonstrated widespread impacts, cost effectiveness, and the ability to give dignity and choice to participants. Based on the large and continued potential for scale up, it's important to understand cash transfer impacts on HIV risk factors. So as of 2018, cash transfers covered about 11% of the population in lower and middle income countries. And there's robust interest from stakeholders given these broad impacts and their cost effectiveness for reducing poverty and food insecurity. Those statistics were as of 2018. But as we know, COVID-19 has dramatically increased social protection measures. As of January 2022, 3,856 social protection and labor measures had been planned or implemented by 223 different economies. 40% of these social protection measures were cash transfers with an average duration of 4.5 months. So COVID-19 has underscored the need for and the importance of social protection. And what do we know about the effects of cash transfers? Well, there's strong evidence that cash transfers reduce poverty, reduce food insecurity, and also reduce negative coping strategies like borrowing money for consumption needs. There's also overwhelming evidence that they increase school attendance and enrollment. There's evidence that cash transfers can reduce sexual exploitation and abuse, particularly among adolescent girls. And there's overwhelming evidence from around the world that cash transfers reduce intimate partner violence. This has been seen with both conditional and unconditional cash transfers, as well as cash transfers, which are targeted to men as well as women. We've seen this evidence around the world in many different regions. And cash transfers in the Africa region have also been shown to delay sexual debut and reduce transactional sex and age disparate relationships. There is 
also evidence, which is more mixed or somewhat limited on the ability of cash transfers to reduce early marriage. So we've seen that government widespread social protection programs can reduce early marriage in settings like Ethiopia. However, these impacts have not been demonstrated in all settings. So the evidence is somewhat mixed. The ability of cash transfers to reduce morbidity and increase health seeking also varies depending on context, whether or not the program has conditions and the quality of health services in the surrounding areas. There was one study in Malawi which showed that cash transfers to adolescent girls and their parents can reduce HIV incidence, while another study in South Africa did not find the same. Most studies do not collect data on HIV incidence, and so we largely have to depend on the evidence that looks at pathways of impact and HIV risk factors, as I showed on the previous slide. So previously, I mentioned that social protection can reduce risk factors and negative coping strategies when they pay attention to gender. What do we mean by paying attention to gender? Well, because we know that the aforementioned risk pathways are gendered, it's important that social protection programs pay attention to gendered vulnerabilities in their design and implementation. And what we mean by paying attention, for example, to HIV vulnerability, HIV sensitive social protection addresses vulnerabilities of people living with HIV, including the increased health costs that they experience, stigma, labor constraints, or programs which otherwise reduce the risk of HIV or mitigate its social and economic impacts. Gender responsive social protection addresses gendered vulnerabilities, including women's reduced access to social and health services, their reduced access and engagement in formal employment, and often difficulties accessing payment points for manual cash payments or their access to and control over cell phones for the delivery of e-payments. Gender responsive social protection may also address unpaid care burdens, for example, by providing access to childcare, or they may address um, the underlying prevailing gender norms and violence risks, which may mitigate some of the potential impacts of transformative impacts of social protection. Cash transfers, despite the overwhelming positive evidence of how cash transfers improve the lives and economic security, health, and well being of individuals and households. Their impacts are often limited by contextual factors. These contextual factors may include the prevailing gender norms, stigma related to poverty or HIV status, or also supply side constraints. Some of the supply side constraints that may constrain the impacts of cash transfers include quality of and distance to health facilities, quality of and distance to schools, and the availability of economic opportunities in the surrounding communities. There are other contextual factors which limit the effectiveness of cash transfers, including inflation, pandemics, and environmental shocks such as droughts and floods and other factors. Recognizing the limitations of cash transfers alone, there's often a need for complementary programming or reinforced linkages to existing services. This is often referred to as integrated social protection or sometimes referred to as cash plus. A definition of cash plus is cash transfers combined with one or more types of complementary support and these may consist of integral elements delivered within the program, such as additional benefits, in-kind transfers, information, behavior change communication, or psychosocial support. Or cash plus may compri be comprised of external components, such as direct provision of access to services or facilitating linkages to existing health or other services. What are some examples of cash plus that's been implemented? Well, Cash Plus may include livelihood strengthening training and asset transfers, case management to identify children or individuals at risk of abuse, child marriage, nutrition, or other adverse outcomes, and link them to the services they need to address these adverse outcomes. Cash Plus may also include food transfers on top of cash transfers, 
or behavior change communication to address outcomes such as nutrition, contraceptive use, and other behaviors. Cash plus may also be linkages to health services. This can be delivered via premium fee waivers for health insurance enrollment. For example, we see this in Ghana's Livelihood Empowerment Against Poverty program. There are also some groups of participants which are eligible for premium fee waivers in Ethiopia's Productive Social Safety Net program. And Zambia is getting ready to roll out premium fee waivers to national health insurance in their social cash transfer program. Linkages to health services may take another form, including behavior change communication and information or health services strengthening to strengthen the supply side. We often see that transformational impacts of cash transfers are often limited by prevailing gender norms. And so one area for expansion of cash plus programs that includes a lot of promise is gender norms interventions accompanied with cash transfer programs. Those are the types of cash plus programs that we see in some settings. So what is the evidence on these programs? Well, the evidence base is still growing. A lot of these initiatives either have not been evaluated or are still being implemented and evaluated. So the evidence base for Cash Plus is not as broad to date as the evidence base on cash transfers alone. However, we have seen strong evidence that Cash Plus programs can increase health insurance enrollment in Ghana it may improve nutrition. Um, one meta-analysis suggested that Cash Plus was not effective in reducing stunting, wasting, and other nutrition outcomes. However, a meta-analysis of results in long-term development context did show that Cash Plus was more effective over cash alone in improving several anthropometric measures. So the evidence on nutrition for Cash Plus, just like it is for cash alone, is somewhat mixed and depends on textual factors. There's growing evidence that Cash Plus can reduce intimate partner violence, and we've seen this in Ghana and Bangladesh. And Cash Plus has been shown to reduce violence against children and youth, including sexual violence against adolescent girls and youth in Tanzania, physical violence against adolescents and youth in Zimbabwe, and corporal punishment or harsh physical punishment of children in Haiti and Bangladesh. It has also been shown to reduce physical violence perpetration among adolescent boys and youth in Tanzania. So in conclusion, social protection can reduce risk factors for HIV and social protection can improve food security and health services access, which are important for ART adherence. The mechanisms of impact are diverse and they include economic security, food security, schooling, adolescent risk behaviors, exposure to high-risk environments, girls and women's empowerment, and access to health services. Nevertheless, there remain several evidence gaps. As I mentioned, several new Cash Plus initiatives are still being evaluated. For example, there is a child grant program in Mozambique linked with case management to identify um, malnutrition and also risk of violence, and those findings have not been released yet. Other innovative Cash Plus initiatives either are not or have not been evaluated. For example, there's the Stawisha Maisha Nutrition Cash Plus component in Tanzania's Productive Social Safety Net, where a pilot program was not implemented, but a new scale-up um, is being planned that will be accompanied by an impact evaluation there are now being planned for rollout linkages to national health insurance in Zambia's social cash transfer program, which have not yet been put into practice, but will be very shortly. And there were several HIV sensitive linkages and plus components in Mozambique, Malawi, and Zambia a few years back, which were not accompanied by a rigorous impact evaluation. In addition to these studies or initiatives that lack evaluations, um, many evaluations are unable to test the PLUS versus the CASH separately or to say anything about the synergistic impacts of CASH and PLUS together above and beyond the contributions of the CASH and the CLIP plus components alone. And this is due to the very complex study designs that are required to be able to tease apart those impacts and the synergies. 
what this evidence shows is that we have an opportunity to broaden our thinking about intersectoral linkages to reduce HIV risk and increase ART adherence. Cash transfers reduce HIV risk factors and they can reduce poverty, food insecurity, intimate partner violence, transactional sex and violence. There's emerging evidence that cash plus can reduce risk factors such as violence and improve health access. So some questions that we're still trying to understand and that I encourage you all to think about in your own work include, how do intersectoral linkages boost these impacts? What is the role of implementation of these linkages and key cadres such as social workers in realizing linkages and impacts? And what is the cost effectiveness of cash transfers in reducing HIV risk? And how does this compare to other HIV focused interventions? Thank you very much. Thank you, Tia. That, that's an excellent and, and informative introduction to the key issues for social protection, addressing these coping strategies. You've provided a great overview of the powerful and intersectoral impacts of core social protection programs like cash transfers, particularly in addressing the economic vulnerability of adolescent girls and young women who remain at such high risk today. And you've gone into the multiplying impact of the Cash Plus programs that link things like information and social services, and very importantly brought in the potential of social protection to tackle adverse social norms. Um, I can see a lot of questions and comments and I'm sure in a few minutes, we'll get into a very robust discussion of these very important points you've made. Um, thank you so much. Uh, next, I want to introduce Juan Gonzalo Jaramillo Mejia and Michael Smith, who will talk about how we can better understand and center social protections contributions to effectively address epidemiological shocks and crises like HIV and AIDS. Um, learning in particular from this lesson. Um, Juan Gonzalo is a social protection program policy officer at the UN's World Food Program. He's currently leading the organization's global knowledge management in social protection. His areas of interest and action have revolved around food security and nutritional outcomes of social protection, in particular, the design and implementation of features that enhance the social, financial inclusion, and gender equitable impacts of interventions. Prior to his assignment to WFP, Juan Gonzalo worked for the Colombian Ministry of Foreign Affairs in China, the Grameen Bank, FAO, ILO, and CGIAR as a foreign and development policy specialist and researcher covering topics from microfinance, bilateral and multilateral cooperation, to the integration of men and masculinities in developmental narratives. And Michael Smith serves as an HIV advisor and UNAIDS partnership officer in the nutrition division at the World Food Program. Before joining the UN, Michael completed his master's of public health at the Econ School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York City with a focus in epidemiology. He has an uh, undergraduate degree in environmental biology and extensive experience in scientific and developmental research in human health, working in regenerative biology, as well as in cell and developmental biology for nearly a decade, co-authoring several peer-reviewed journals in the process, journal articles in the process. Since 2019, he leads WFP's strategic partnership and co-sponsorship of UNAIDS and co-leads the interagency task team on HIV sensitive social protection along with the ILO. And so we're really delighted to have both of them here to present uh, this new framework on EpiSmart social protection. Um, we're lo really looking forward to engaging on these innovative ideas and how they can help ensure uh, HIV sensitive social protection leaves no one behind. Uh, Juan Gonzalo, I think you're leading off here. <laughs> 
Yeah, thank you, Michael. And thank you for inviting us to present, um, you know, our work around epidemiologically smart social protection. Uh, I'll give the, the, the word to my colleague, uh, Michael, for us to... Yeah, thank you very much for having us. And we're, we're so excited to, to finally be able to present this framework that we've been working on for, for some time now. Great. Um, so the first thing is that we want to tell you the three objectives of this meeting today uh, that we can exactly, as you mentioned, Michael, uh, revolve around understanding, centering, addressing epidemiological shock. So, Michael, can you tell us a little bit more? Yeah, exactly. So uh, as, as we have in the title and as we sort of spelled out in the description of the, the presentation, we've really been looking to not only center but focus and understand social protections role and, and kind of responsibility, frankly, um, in supporting health outcomes related to HIV, but, but not only. And that's where we broaden this conversation around other epidemiological contexts and health shocks. So one of the first things that we had to do in kind of uh, formulating or, or starting this, this shared interest in research was, was understand. And that was doing quite a bit of research, looking at evidence-based approaches, um, combing through the extant literature, of how, where, and why social protection plays a role in response to HIV uh, and other outbreaks as well. Um, we then had to sort of center our focus and begin to develop, hone, and identify an analytical and operational framework that would explain um, and illustrate social protection's kind of explicit and cogent roles in supporting health outcomes, moving from descriptive analysis and policy-oriented guidance and looking really at kind of the practical and programmatic implications um, to substantiate that evidence for action, which Juan and I will present throughout this presentation. I think the final piece here is, is bringing in this epi shock or this uh, epidemiological lens where we've actually through months and months of looking at the extant literature base, as I mentioned, found that while there was evidence, it was somewhat fragmented, but we've had to borrow from other shocks and outbreaks, um, not just HIV, of course, looking at Ebola, COVID-19, um, and TB as well. Juan, over to you. Great, thank you. So why did we embark on, on this whole um, venture of going a little bit beyond HIV into epidemiological uh, smart social protection? So first of all, is that we saw that there's an urgent need to contextualize and build synergies between HIV and AIDS and broader public health interventions, but are, but are that are not just, but quite, quite, quite very much in the COVID context and a pandemic context, looking at communicable or infectious diseases. And we understood that there's a bi-directional um, learning pathway here. First, we needed to look at HIV evidence to see how we can uh, really improve public health responses. And we saw that uh, very much with the COVID-19 crisis where we said, okay, there's already evidence on how social protection can support health specific outcomes. Um, but but the, unfortunately this, this evidence was not fully capitalized, right? So we saw, of course, as, at the same time that even if we were making advances into HIV and AIDS, other shocks or of other infectious diseases as, as COVID-19 may become, but may create new constraints and become binding as we saw in the pandemic, reversing the hard earned gains that we've had uh, in terms of HIV and AIDS, for example. But then at the same time, we understand that HIV and AIDS can also learn from other public health responses and how social protection has acted uh, to respond to those. And we've understood very much, and we will see that uh, in two slides, that we live in a syndemic context, in a context in which HIV doesn't operate in a silo, but unfortunately it interacts, aggregates, and aggravates the, 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 you know, the impacts of other diseases. So we live in a syndemic um, in where there's synergies between different um, diseases. So with that, uh, what we've understood also is that um, yes, social protection became quite important, particularly in the pandemic, uh, to respond, as Tia was saying, with an unparalleled number of measures and investments um, to, to ensure that we address the, the social economic impacts and health impacts of an infectious disease as COVID-19. But we saw that there were lots of shortcomings in the way that this was framed and the way that the social protection sector is already thinking on responding on shocks that are epidemiological in nature. So first of all, as we said, it didn't build on existing evidence, particularly in HIV where there's uh, you know, good literature 
uh, and an evidence base. Second, we've seen a reliance on shock responsive modalities. We'll talk a little bit about them quickly in some slides ahead, but we were seeing that, you know, they're really good at supporting the response, the systemic response of social protection mm -hmm. to those shocks, but they were not really adopting a health lens that, that really um, supported a continuum of care. And then even if we were looking at the continuum of care, which has been very much endorsed by UNAIDS, we saw that that continuum of care lacks some essential elements of resilience that are big in the social protection agenda. Right, and finally, we understood that yes, uh, th there is, as, as Tia was mentioning, uh, we see how food security, food insecurity, is correlated with lack of adherence, for example. But it is not just in adherence, but in now in the continuum of care, it plays an essential role, and it mediates uh, quite directly in 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 ensuring you know that health outcomes are achieved, right, and sustained. So those are a little bit of the rationale and what we're doing. So now let's talk about a syndemic context. I was introducing this, this concept, Michael, can you, can you help Pick us up there? on that? Of course, Juan. So yeah, as, as we've mentioned and we'll continue to mention um, this, this kind of crucial principle of, of living in a syndemic context really. And um, I think while the, the concept has been well established over the last couple of decades. COVID-19 has really kind of forced this conversation um, in a way that it can't be ignored, frankly, anymore. Um, and as Juan rightly mentioned, um, there's a lot of urgency around this. So this endemic context requires um, really more systematic, frankly, thinking um, around what needs to be done to, to support the most vulnerable people who are facing and living with maybe more than one disease or more than one disease or susceptible to more than one disease. So. Here we've just showed graphically um, in the Eastern and Southern African region. On the left hand side of the graphic, you have a high concentration of, of HIV, HIV and TB burden. And the one right next to it is also COVID. And if you just have sort of a quick take, um, those two graphics look almost identical, right? So you're kind of overlaying HIV, TB and COVID-19 as well. And so what a lot of projections and modeling has recently shown is that there's this synergistic element that's coming, um, not only in terms of morbidity, but also in terms of mortality, where you have people living with HIV and TB who now are projected to have um, almost 2 million additional deaths due to COVID-19 complications. And you layer on top of that deaths as a result of COVID-19, um, reaching kind of a, a global potential burden of almost 4 million deaths in total. And that's just looking at HIV and TB and COVID. So again, just to reinforce the urgency to think systematically about this, and again, our efforts to pursue and articulate social protection's role uh, in supporting public health responses. Next, I think it's important just to touch a little bit on the background and sort of the genesis for this work. Um, and I think speaking as WFP, an HIV sensitive agenda, and that really is kind of chiefly sort of my role and responsibility in our work linking up with key partners in our strategic relationship, not only with UNAIDS, but also the ILO. And I know that Tia, Lucy, Michael, and a lot of people on the call are aware of our division of labor role within our, our kind of relationship with UNAIDS, and that is working very closely with the ILO to advance a social protection agenda. Um, but I think also it's important to touch on why the work on HIV links well with, with Juan's, um, Juan Gonzalo's division in social protection and why looking at poverty, risk, vulnerability, and social exclusion are relevant not only for HIV, but for other infectious diseases. And so through this collaboration and through the development of this framework, we've seen that infectious diseases, not only HIV, TB, Ebola, and others, of course, mostly concentrated on the content of Africa, continue to be drivers of poverty, risk, vulnerability, and exclusion. And we still don't really seem to have a conclusive or systematic answer in how best to support um, from a non-biomedical standpoint. So, you know, this really has come out of a conversation of, um, I think my role in kind of a more niche HIV sector, and, and of course needing to reach across the aisle to speak cogently and accurately to social protection practitioners on why these two agendas need to be linked up. Uh, more, more concretely and more cohesively. Great, thank you, Michael. So let's let's talk about how can we describe the consequences of health shocks and social protection's contribution broadly. Um, building obviously on the great presentation that 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 Tia made for us. Um, so we're going to build this 
step by step. First of all, let's understand what's kind of like the problem that we, we face with, um, with, uh, with, with shocks. And the first problem we have is that we navigate uh, a context that is, is, is quite unequal. So we see that there is a set of economic, geographical, social, and often intersecting inequalities that also uh, compound and aggravate the, the, the ability for people to really pave their own way out of poverty. And we see that the key word here or what those inequalities do is that they create a vulnerability. What is the vulnerabilities of people, the inability of people to really be able to meet their essential needs and address the risks and shocks that they face throughout their lives. And this becomes a vicious cycle, a vicious circle. And then what happens is that then you have this epidemiological shock. And this shock comes to play in this very unequal context, in this very um, difficult context in which people are already limited in their ability to already address idiosyncratic life cycle related shocks now with a systemic shock like this one and being unable to meet their needs and obviously increase as we have there the proxy of poverty, right? But then when this shock hits, we immediately see that there's various impact domains and consequences. And Michael was just mentioning this. This, this is the need of bringing public health and social protection together. So the public health sector is looking more at the biomedical and health uh, impacts of a pandemic, of a, of, a, of a shock, let's say, like this, like the pandemic we just lived. And then you have social protection that is more focused on the social economic impacts of this. Normally, we would see the domain of health in which we see the public health sector really working and, and, and the consequences being the, you know, higher mortality and higher morbidity. But we've seen uh, quite, quite recently also with this pandemic, how the social economic impacts are, you know, how, how they come and what form they come. And we see economically like how people have lower incomes and have to pay higher costs and, and socially there's social capital losses and human capital losses with long-term impacts. Right? So this is the problem and we've said, okay, we've understood and I think it's well positioned that social protection has a role to play, right? And that's kind of like in the response. And we have social protection and, and we see that there's a, a big focus on cash transfers. And we've put it here as a hammer, kind of reminding us that not because we have a hammer, every problem's a nail, uh, but there's a, a toolbox, a set of tools from school feeding to in-kind transfers, to fee waivers, subsidies, input or asset transfers, to just mention a few, that support uh, people in various ways. And we have categorized, we have clustered the way that social protection works building on Alderman et al. from 2015 uh, on four impact pathways that we will unpack in, a, in, a, in, in the next slide. But, just for, for, for your knowledge, social protection work its magic, if we can call it like that, through four pathways, through incomes, assets, prices, and behaviors. And we see that really the glue here, right, as we've learned particularly from the HIV sector, is that it needs to work around a continuum of care model to ensure that those incomes, assets, prices can really support people, first of all, in supporting people's ability to diagnose, to treat and adhere to life-saving medicine. But also we've realized that it has a play, it has a role to play ensuring, you know, resilience by preventing people from, from contracting a disease. And after they've gone through the whole process of testing, treating and adhering of recovering and ensuring, you know, their, their resilience. But this, this thing is not a silver bullet. Social protection's role is not is not is not the magic bullet right here, uh, because those intersecting inequalities also affect the ability to access. And we were just looking at, at, at the gender, for example, dimensions of this. How is it that you know, for example, women have difficulties in accessing already social protection interventions, but not just accessing, but effectively using, controlling, and benefiting from social protection. That's a big problem in which if we work in an unequal 
um, context and social protection is not really able to, to be sensitive to these issues, it's gonna limit its ability to work its magic. And second, we can ensure that there's a link and, and social protection can support uh, a continuum of care model, you know, but we need supply side, supply side economics here because social protection, we know it's a demand side intervention that supports people's uptake of, of, of services, of essential services like health and education. But you know, and we know that we have supply side constraints in terms of quality from those social sectors. So in order for this framework to really work, you need those at least, you know, those critical elements of the inter of understanding the intersecting qualities we were just mentioning at the very beginning and ensuring that supply and demand are, are really in sync. So what we were saying is that there's four impact pathways and those four impact pathways are it depend no matter the, uh, the, the instrument that you use will have an impact somehow in these elements in incomes because it ensures that people have an increased purchasing power, for example, of goods and services, income security during shocks, for example, and addressing opportunity costs in terms of assets. It ensures that we're able to build, to promote people's human capital, social capital, and, and, and how are they ensuring that they won't rely on these negative coping strategies such as selling um, assets or, or yeah, or reducing, you know, or selling, you know, kind of like their cow or their their their, their car, their assets that ensure that they they will have income, right? In terms of prices, we see this very interestingly in, in for example, in the health sector, and we see this a lot in West Africa, that there's fee waivers. So ensures that they're sustainable, equitable, and effective access to those services. We also see that in terms of prices, you can not just have a, a fee waiver, but you can ensure to have subsidies that ensure that, you know, um, that, that increased expenditure in health, for example, it's offset, right? And then in terms of behavior, it's quite interestingly, and we see this a lot with conditional cash transfers in which we are incentivizing very directly health-seeking behavior. Uh, but, but also we are, we are understanding that because people can have the reliability, they understand the predictability of the social protection programs, they would reduce hyperbolic discounting, which comes from behavioral economics, which is they're gonna put as much relevance in the future costs as uh, they are doing in the present. So reduction, uh, reducing transactional sex, child marriage, taking children out of school. So we see that social protection would, it's not either or, it's, it's kind of like it works in these different avenues in, in, in sync many times to ensure that we are addressing not just the socioeconomic impacts, but also the health impacts of, a, of, an, of an epidemiological shock. So, what we see here, and I'll give the, the word to Michael um, next, is that we need a continuum of care model because the shock response of social protection mechanisms we've seen don't precisely understand the, 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 the process that people need to follow in order to recover and deal with the impacts of an epidemiological shocks. Shock responsive social protection just use a blanketed approach to ensure that we ensure vertical expansion, giving people more money, extend you know, coverage of social protection benefits to a, to a greater um, number of people that are vulnerable in a, in, a, in a context, or you're adapting a program to ensure that maybe the frequency uh, or the delivery mechanisms are, are adapted to the changing circumstances. That's normally what you do within a social protection program. And then you do, you piggyback, maybe without a humanitarian response, you piggyback on the data, the information system of a, of a social protection system to understand who's in or who's out, or you ensure alignment with the transfer value not to uh, sabotage, let's say, the, 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 the national system. But none of this really has an implication, how do you support people in this continuum of care? And you understand the specificities of a health shock. So we're trying to, with this like kind of uh, mentioning the limitations that we see from taking this very uh, important uh, and influential framework for responding to shocks in general. So Michael, can you tell us then about the continuum of care? We see that this, um, this, this blanketed responses are not adequate enough. How what are we saying about the continuum of care? Why it's so important? And how are we revisiting that? 
Yeah, and the, the reason it's important, I think, and Juan has shown in the last couple of slides, is that we've deconstructed a little bit some of the complexity around the situation we're, we're all kind of dealing with and coping with, looked at social protection's role, um, where there's value to be added, where there are specific um, areas where social protection can explicitly support, but also looking at some of the limitations in the model. And as Juan said earlier, the continuum of care model a little bit is like the glue that brings these sort of different pieces together. Um, and so we know that social protection has a kind of direct role in supporting health outcomes. And that's kind of where we started. Um, so we see that social protection is just gonna kind of come over the top there and support health. And that's kind of the, 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 the beginning the first phase. We know that when there's an outbreak, we know there's a health shock or other shocks. Um, this relationship is pretty well established. And Juan mentioned the UNAIDS treatment cascade, which is, again, globally accepted, politically supported, focuses on testing, treatment, and adherence. Okay, nothing really new there. But in the development of, of kind of this framework and, and, and informing our thinking, we know that food security and nutrition also has a foundational role to supporting health outcomes not only, but also supporting this continuum of care. Again, not only looking at kind of the well-established test treatment and adherence pieces, but also these critical elements that Juan Gonzalo mentioned around resilience. That's looking at preventing impacts around disease. That's around looking at recovery. So food security and nutrition also isn't just contributing directly to health. And Tia mentioned quite a few examples where food security and nutrition builds resilience across the continuum, preventing, of course, before a shock happens, also in responding to a shock, but in these an, an additional phase that we've added along recovery as well. So that's the continuum of care model. Next, we're gonna see really how this all comes together uh, in the final version of our epidemiologically smart framework. So, as we look at this from sort of left to right, we see social protections role and the various impact pathways that Juan Gonzalo has elucidated and, and playing a key role. And as I just mentioned, in the blue bands go, running across, you'll see food security nutrition's foundational support and the role that food security nutrition play in concert with social protection in supporting a continuum of care, which you'll see along the top of prevention, testing, treatment, adherence, and recovery. Now, it would of course be kind of impossible to, to walk through this whole slide at once. So I'm just gonna kind of pick um, one box and, and look at that quickly. So if we were to look at, let's say, supporting testing uh, through the use of incomes, right? And this is a, a fairly well-established linkage around um, the direct, indirect, and opportunity costs of going to get testing. That's often something that is cited in the literature is a major impediment to initiating care, treatment, and support programs. Now, what can incomes do there? Uh, and what can food security and nutrition do there? So that's about reducing those costs, right? And, and making sure that someone doesn't have to choose um, between you know, food security, having nutrition, being able to put food on the table for their families and going to get essential healthcare services. Um, you know, we've, we've tried to fit this in across in a way that's that's hopefully easy to, to consume. Um, but the, the main takeaways here, again, is this overlaying of the different pieces that, that Juan and I have, have talked about and identifying social protections role across four main impact pathways, the crucial and foundational role that food security and nutrition play in supporting this continuum of care model that you see at the top. So we can move to the next one. So we have some additional considerations that make this EpiSmart approach um, effective. And, and one of them is that, that we've said a few times that the evidence that we found thus far, um, frankly, has been a little bit inadequate and fragmented. Um, and that's what has kind of forced our hand a little bit in building this, this epidemiologically smart model. Um, of course, saying that, we know that there is a systematic need to have sort of an all-in approach that Juan and I like to say, that gives relevance to each phase and each step of the continuum of care where social protection's contribution is realized through that crucial role that food security and nutrition are playing to realize better outcomes. Now the continuum, as we've seen, is not really a la carte. And we've, we've kind of built up these additional pieces around resilience building related to prevention and recovery, expanding on the well-established UNAIDS treatment cascade that a lot of you are familiar with. Um, the focus of, of, of the model and our work thus far has been on non-contributory social assistance. Um, platforms and, you know, again, reiterating what Juan mentioned in, in the diagram of the complexity around these situations is that social protection is not a silver bullet. 
Um, a lot of times we, we talk about, you know, how, how incredible social protection is, but there's a, an express need to talk about the quality supply side policies and interventions from other sectors. And of course, the complementary social equity measures that address various and often intersecting forms of inequality that, that Juan illustrated earlier. So. Great, thank you, Mike, for that. So let's, we're, we're just reaching our, our you know, reaching the our last line. <laughs> and, and what are the four key takeaways that we want, you know, based on our research that we would like you to take home basically, you know, that, you know, HIV AIDS response isn't continues to be central in this endemic context, but not enough. And so the day is a specific and biomedical center approaches are over specifically, we want to advance HIV and social protection agendas together in this endemic world. So I think that what we need here to really show is, you know, what we really try to drive home is first that we, we, we understand uh, the very complex context in which we live in, which is syndemic in nature. Second, that we, we understand that we need a multi-sectoral effort in which we really need uh, a greater collaboration between social protection and public health. But also we, we need that this, that when we're thinking about health shocks, epidemiological shocks, we're both kind of bringing the two sectors, right? From the public health sector together with the social economic concerns that the social protection one has so that they really go in tandem and support, you know, people's, um, you know, resilience and not just their ability to, to deal in, in, in C2 really with the, with, the, with, with, the, with the systemic epidemiological shocks as the one we've seen. And then obviously we're coming from the World Program and we've seen firsthand how food security and nutrition are essential, not just to support people in this coping strategy, but in preventing people from exposing themselves to, to disease and, 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 and not being able to really um, uh, build their human capital for enhanced resilience and ability to deal with this in the long term, with these shocks in the long term. So Michael, any additional points? Not really, Juan. I think we, we've covered everything. Um, and, and just again, the, the main takeaways are, you know, the, the, the fact and the urgency of, of operating in, in kind of a multi, multi-disease multi world now. Um, and, and a lot of that urgency and focus has been brought on by COVID, but I think it's afforded us the opportunity to step back a little bit um, and I think reassess and acknowledge how um, significantly social protection now is being used and leveraged as a tool to respond. And we can use that, of course, to, to continue to support the global AIDS response and end it as a public health threat by 2030. But we see that there's value in this approach beyond HIV and other infectious diseases as well. Great, thank you very much. And thank you for every, uh, to Epi for inviting us. Great, well, thank you, Juan Gonzalo. Thank you, Michael Smith. And this has been an excellent and insightful analysis and uh, very innovative and valuable framework. Um, it's great to see how you integrate the diversity of instruments, a really integrated toolkit to achieve the comprehensive outcomes that are so important. Um, and to see how you've mapped out the importance of the continuum of care. And, and I agree with you, Michael, it's social protection is not a magic bullet. It, it works hand in hand with other interventions. So we're really delighted to have Rachel Yates and Lucy Kluver to talk about their exciting work on integrated programming. Um, and they'll help answer the question on how governments and their development partners can advance HIV sensitive social protection in the aftermath of this COVID-19 pandemic that I'm sure we're all very tired of, but seems to be becoming increasingly endemic uh, and something we're going to have to uh, build better frameworks for tackling um, Juan Gonzalo and Michael Smith as, as your model aims to do. Um, let me start by introducing uh, Dr. Rachel Yates. She joined the Accelerate Hub in January, 2021 as the strategic advocacy lead. Rachel works with the hub directors, researchers, and policy colleagues to develop and deliver the hub's advocacy strategy. She's worked in international development 
for 25 years, including with the UK's Department for International Development, UNICEF, and civil society organizations. She brings extensive policy and programming expertise in poverty reduction, gender equality, and social inclusion, including sector work on HIV prevention and care, social protection, child protection, with a recent focus supporting the evidence and learning agenda on child marriage. Rachel has worked extensively in Africa, including in Zimbabwe, Ghana, Uganda, Malawi, Mozambique, Rwanda, and Nigeria. And I'm also delighted to introduce Dr. Lucy Kluver. She's the professor of child and family social work in the Center for Evidence-Based Social Intervention in the Department of Social Policy and Intervention at the University of Oxford and an honorary professor in psychiatry and mental health at the University of Cape Town. She works closely with the South African government um, as well as development partners such as UNDP, USAID PEPFAR, UNICEF, UNAIDS, the Global Partnership to End Violence Against Children, WHO and other international agencies to provide evidence that can improve the lives of children and adolescents in Sub-Saharan Africa. And from 2019, Lucy has been the principal investigator for the UKRI GCRF Accelerating Achievement for Africa's Adolescence Hub. Uh, Lucy has an exceptional track record of impact and in the past three years has been awarded the European Union Horizon 2020 Impact Award in 2019 the UNICEF Women Leaders in the HIV Response for Children in 2018, and the ESRC Outstanding International Impact Prize in 2017. In 2019, she was recognized as one of UKRI's 15 women with impact and research. Um, and they both give an excellent and inspiring presentation on advancing HIV sensitive social protection. So, we're really looking forward to this uh, concluding session. Uh, Lucy and Rachel, over to you. Thank you so much, um, Michael. And just to say that Rachel and I had decided that Juan Gonzalo and, and Michael do such a good double act that we are going to try to rival that with an all girls double act um, now. But really just um, what we're going to focus on today is really the next steps from what Tia and Michael and Juan Gonzalo have been talking about and thinking about some of the um, evidence and operationalization of, um, of the, the conceptualization that they've brought to you. So really, if we dive straight in and think about COVID and HIV, and, um, and Michael and Juan Gonzalo were talking about this intersectionality between the two pandemics. And just for some examples, we see some direct evidence of impacts of COVID, um, 7 million anticipated unplanned pregnancies, uh, rises, substantial rises in child marriage, um, school dropout, and um, and pushed people pushed into extreme poverty at massive rates. And of course, for anyone who has been working in the HIV world, we recognise that those um, those those outcomes of COVID are also outcomes that we see from HIV, and they are also um, contexts and situations as as. Um, as colleagues at World Food Programme said, that lead directly into HIV risks. And, and we've seen this very clearly in a set of pathways, and particularly for adolescents, and in Sub-Saharan Africa, particularly for adolescent girls and for the most vulnerable. And we'll start talking a bit more about the most vulnerable and, and how social protection can best support them. What we're also seeing coming out of COVID-19 is um, an almost parallel orphanhood crisis to, to that we saw, um, that we are still seeing in HIV. Um, and as just an example, this is from Imperial College's um, COVID orphanhood calculator. And using new IHME estimates combined with economist estimates, we're seeing around 10 million children have lost a parent or um, to, a, to COVID in the last just over two years. And this is added to the, to the um, existing huge number of 14 million children who've lost a parent to HIV AIDS. And so we, and we know that those children are at higher risk of sexual exploitation, of adolescent pregnancy, and HIV infection themselves. 
So again, a, a very clear operationalization of these sets of, of um, compounding and very interlinked risks. And in many ways, this um, the, the kind of there has been this pushing ahead in our thinking about social protection, and um, and this has been led by. Um, particularly colleagues at, um, at World Food Programme, but also particularly at uh, UNICEF Innocenti and ECRI have really made us think about going beyond the kind of very simple ideas of social protection to thinking about understanding how it can work in, um, in the context of HIV and HIV prevention, but now in the interlinked context of COVID. But what does this look like when it's delivered in, in the real world, in a real world African government situation. Well, let's take a look at, um, at adolescent girls and HIV risks. So we know from phylogenetic evidence that um, transactional sex or sex with um, older partners is um, probably the greatest uh, risk for HIV infection or the greatest contributor to HIV infection amongst adolescent girls in the southern and eastern Africa region. And, and there has been um, you know, millions, if not billions, poured into behavioral interventions to try and reduce this, to, to educate girls, to, to persuade them to, to not engage in these relationships. But when we actually look at what predicts that kind of relationship, we start to see this very different story. And, and this is cross-sectional data, but what it shows essentially is that an adolescent girl on the left who lives in a healthy family, who has no one, no parents sick with HIV and is, um, has enough to eat um, and does not experience abuse as physical or emotional abuse by their caregivers, has a just under 1% chance of having a transactional sexual relationship. If we look to the right hand side, we see that a girl living in a family with um, an AIDS unwell parent who's living with abuse and it doesn't have enough to eat, has a 57% chance of transactional sex. Immediately, we're starting to see a very clear example of this, of the vulnerability pathway and the social economic vulnerability leading into these HIV risks. So what then, how then does social protection and can it work to reduce those risks? Well, this is um, a, um, a study which, um, which um, has taken place as the South African government scaled up its, um, its social protection um, grant, its, its child's main child support grant from age 10 to age 17 or 18 over a number of years. And of course, as with any government um, scale up, that was patchy. And there was able to be a natural experiment looking at um, whether adolescent um, girls and boys who received um, cash transfers through the system um, had redu reduced rates of HIV risk. And what we, what we found in this study was firstly that, um, that it, it didn't make a huge difference cash alone for boys. And there was various sexual risks that it didn't make a difference on it. For example, it didn't make a difference on um, adolescents getting drunk and having sex. But it did make a huge difference on these two major and the strongest drivers of HIV infection. And that was a 50% reduction in incidence of transactional sex and a 70% reduction in incidence of age disparate sex. So we're immediately seeing this evidence of the child support grant and national social protection program reducing HIV risk. We see exactly, and this came out of it almost exactly the same time as work um, led by Michael Sampson and UNICEF with the South African government, looking at the same government cash transfer and finding again these clear HIV risk reductions of, of the grant. And, and adding to that, Michael Sampson's work found that the earlier the grant was received in, in an adolescent's life, if it started when they were much younger, we saw greater benefits over time. And that's gonna be really important as we think about the, the delivery of social protection on a national scale. But what about some of those most vulnerable? We've been thinking about generalized populations. Perhaps one of the most vulnerable groups in our region is adolescent mothers. And this is some work we've been doing with colleagues at the World Food Programme, some of whom it's lovely to see here. But essentially thinking about how does food security, which, which in South Africa for these groups is primarily achieved through social protection of different sorts, how does it impact um, these HIV risks, which we see for very much higher rate 
for adolescent mothers. And again, they're a group to think about. A third of girls in sub-Saharan Africa are having children before the age of 20. And there's often a, um, an assumption that these girls are um, promiscuous or that they've, um, they've behaved badly and that they continue to, to do so. Instead, we find an incredibly strong impact of, um, of food security on reductions of HIV risk, both for non-mothers, but even more strongly for adolescent mothers. So if we look to the left, we see that for adolescent girls who are not mothers, we see that having enough to eat um, in the last week um, predicts reductions in transactional sex, um, it improves in improvement in um, enrollment in education or taking part in employment and reductions in multiple sexual partners. But if you look to the right, you see that for an adolescent mother at a, at a starting from a possibly a more vulnerable situation, that having enough to eat reduces transactional sex, multiple partners, alcohol use, sex and substances, school dropout, and age disparate sex. So we're seeing that this national cash transfer system is in substantially improving outcomes for the most vulnerable. Now, we've been focusing um, on, on particular uh, groups of HIV prevention related groups, but we also have to think for in any kind of HIV work about those who are living with HIV. And, um, and what we see here is um, some, some work that was published in, in 2019 looking at a whole set of possible interventions, uh, everything from, um, from um, schooling to, to home-based interventions to community care interventions, and asking what can impact uh, multiple outcomes, and including HIV outcomes for these young people living with HIV. And three interventions popped out as the most impactful across as, as many outcomes as possible. And we see that that's getting good parenting support, going to a safe school and getting a government cash transfer. And if we look just at the government cash transfer, we see reductions in abuse of 12%, improvements in school progression of 16%, and improvements in retention in HIV care of 13%. Now, see if you can remember those numbers, because this then speaks directly to what Tia said in her, our first talk, which was that we often lack evidence which tells us What's the difference between having cash alone and a cash plus approach? Now, of course, what we probably don't have is very good data on that from randomized control trials, or there is some new stuff coming out from Kenya. But this, this um, survey, longitudinal survey, can start to give us clues. And so if we look again at cash transfers, we can then see what happens when we combine those three interventions into a cash plus approach. What we see is that when an adolescent living with HIV receives a combination of these programs, we see greater improvements across more outcomes. So the um, reduction in abuse has gone from 12% to 51%. The improvement in HIV care retention has gone from 13% to 22%. And we're also seeing improvements in mental health, school progression, high-risk sex reduction, violence, perpetration, and victimization. If we move out of South Africa to another country, this is work spearheaded by the UNICEF and Achenti team, Ashu Handa and colleagues, we see that the, Kenya, the Kenyan government's OVC cash transfer, which was done um, with, with the World Bank, has results in very similar outcomes, reductions in pregnancy, improvements in school enrollment, reductions in sexual, um, early sexual debut. If we think in, in, in another country about a highly vulnerable group, this is adolescents um, living in families with disabilities. This is work um, led by David Chapanta. We see that a, um, a, a, um, a large scale social cash transfer combined with access to learning and interestingly for, for some of our thinking about new technologies, access to mobile phones improves again, a range of outcomes from school enrollment to poverty reduction. And we know that adolescents living with disabilities are at higher risk of contracting sexually transmitted infections and that these can reduce their risks. This is work, um, you know, which I feel I can't even talk about, spearheaded by, um, by Tia, by Ricky and, and other colleagues here. But this was the incredible work done by the Tanzanian government, UNICEF um, and Oak Foundation in Tanzania, where, um, where there was a kind of incredibly clever add-on 
to the government social, um, social cash transfer with youth-friendly SRHR services, livelihoods, life skills training, and an add-on productive grant. And we see from their randomized control trial evidence, which has just come out, this incredible set of outcomes for adolescents, um, and particularly strong for adolescents and young women. And any complicated questions about this, ask Tia and Ricky, not, not me. But are we see it starting to see some patterns across the region? Well, if you think back to Tia's um, talk and, and Michael and Juan Gonzalez's talk, we're clearly seeing that, um, that, that the cash plus approach seems to be um, the most, most effective. And the plus does seem to be context dependent, but some very strong patterns are coming out where we're seeing cash plus uh, parenting programs, cash plus adolescent friendly health services delivered through different means, sometimes through state systems, sometimes through, um, through NGO based systems. Cash plus, and there's something about uh, mental health aspirations and peer support that does seem to be effective, particularly for outcomes like intimate partner violence and cash plus comprehensive sexuality education, which links us back into thinking about how we can combine some of the more traditional HIV approaches with social protection. I'm gonna move over to Rachel now to think about cost effectiveness and implementation. Thank you, Lucy. Um, so moving on to also looking at what some of the future opportunities are for implementing some of these more cost effective approaches. Um, I want to just mention briefly uh, some of the work we've been doing in Lesotho with the Global Fund and um, building on the analysis of risk pathways and understanding particularly who is most at risk. You see in Lesotho a really acute need amongst adolescent girls and young women, particularly in the 2024 uh, year old age group, where girls are almost five times more likely to be living with HIV. So the question is in this context, how can social protection really build up resilience and interrupt some of these risks? Uh, next slide. Um, so what we've been doing um, with the uh, Ministry of Finance and the Project Management Unit in Lesotho and with uh, colleagues, some of whom are in this room and um, with uh, looking at the, the, the evidence in Lesotho, we've been trying to sort of unpack what are the risk factors that really are driving the epidemic. And we have a very complicated diagram, but this is just one of the key risk pathways, looking at how poverty uh, is impacting on things like school education, uh, school dropout and progression, um, how that then leads on to things like uh, early um, sexual debut motherhood and so on. And then on top of that, thinking about what are the types of social protection and economic strengthening interventions that can disrupt these, um, these different pathways. Um, Lucy, next few slides and two more, thank you. Um, oh, so do you just go back one? So in the case of Lesotho, um, there are, as um, uh, Juan Gonzalo pointed out, there is a vast number of different tools in the toolkit for addressing these risk pathways. We have child grants, there are education bursaries, and also um, programs that are outside the social protection sector, like life skills programs. So I think the challenge for us working on social protection in the context of HIV is really thinking how we can leverage some of these existing programs to interrupt these different risk pathways. Next slide. Um, so in Lesotho, and this is um, building on some work that EPRI have been leading on, um, there's a, a whole new social protection strategy and action plan being developed with really exciting opportunities to expand social protection, particularly for vulnerable adolescents. So in a context like Lesotho and many others across Africa, it's really thinking about how we can leverage and build on some of these different interventions uh, to bring about better HIV outcomes. Next slide. Um, I think, as was mentioned earlier, there is, I think, generally an excitement about, uh, not necessarily an excitement, but uh, an opportunity that's been acknowledged about the number of new social policy and social protection mechanisms that have uh, been generated as a result of the COVID crisis. And I think Ugo Gentili estimates there have been over 170 of these. But actually, what's really important is when you look at where the social 
uh, protection expenditure is increasing or decreasing, it paints a different story. And we can see from this graph that's come out of some recent work from UNICEF in Achenti, that in many countries uh, and many regions, including Eastern and Southern Africa, there appears to have been a, a slight decline in social protection expenditure. Um, but also um, the where um, donor expenditure has increased, um, it often has been sort of skewed towards some of the better off countries. And I think there's only like a $1 increase uh, per capita in, in low income countries. So really important to think about that in the context of social protection, new investments. Um, and this also highlights the importance of thinking through uh, the cost effectiveness of the approaches and what type of cash plus interventions work. And I know time is limited, so I won't go into this in great detail, but I think part of the, the challenge around thinking through these cash plus cost effectiveness equations is really thinking how we can measure impact and effectiveness across multiple sectors and taking a broader developmental perspective. And if you're often looking at what works from a sector perspective, for example, um, reducing HIV infections, a cost effective approach might point to things like voluntary male circumcision. Or similarly, if you're keeping um, girls in school, the investments might be going into a, an education sector investment. But if we think beyond our individual silos and thinking about how an intervention like cash and parenting can have broader impacts, when we've done the analysis, it appears that some of these cash plus interventions, when looking across reductions in violence, school dropout and HIV, can have a much greater multiplier effect and be development accelerators for a whole range of outcomes, including HIV incidents, violence, cases and school dropout and actually um, massively increase the number of case reductions across the board. So I think this is the real challenge for us, as Tia said, is really how we think through cost effectiveness of these packages across multiple outcomes, including HIV. Next slide. So in conclusion, we're seeing from our analysis that accelerators do boost um, Africa's adolescence and both cash and food transfers are reducing HIV risk and mitigating the impact on, of pandemics, particularly for adolescent girls and also with huge potential for addressing some of the uh, orphaning needs that we're seeing both from COVID and from HIV. Um, and we really see that there are opportunities to modify these social protection programs so that they are having impacts both across HIV and other sectors. Okay, uh, we'll leave it there for now, but thank you again, EPRI, for this opportunity. Um, thank you, Rachel, and thank you, Lucy. Um, this is inspiring evidence and I think really demonstrates um, not only the powerful role of accelerators as, as you've been working with them, but the broader implications of comprehensive programming and your work really addresses one of the key questions that has been percolating in the chat um, and one I want to raise for the entire panel um, because you have adopted methodologies that are appropriate for evaluating complex outcomes and complex processes. And uh, we heard from Tia a lot about the evidence and um, the, the evidence um, often is mixed. Um, it, it even gave rise to one question on the chat, whether this means there's no empirical evidence on cash plus programming. And, and we're often at conferences where we hear that a randomized control trial was implemented on a cash transfer program and the program has no impact on nutrition um, or, or other very strong statements based on evaluation approaches that have limited capacity to understand complexity. Um, one of the questions on the chat was when evaluating cash programs, how can we control for co confounders? Um, 
And you've begun to answer that, Lucy and Rachel, but it might be worth talking about this more. Um, Tia had mentioned that there is mixed evidence on the impact of cash transfers on nutrition. Um, and, and we see on the chat a comment from one of the participants about their positive experience with social protection and reducing high rates of malnutrition. Um, and, and another important question about the contextual and specific nature of evidence and the importance of um, understanding how, how realities within a region vary from one community to another. So um, let me start, uh, Tia, with you, um, then just go through the panel, Juan Gonzalo, Michael, Rachel, and, and Lucy. Can you give us your thoughts on how best to build an evidence base for complexity, given the complexity of nutrition outcomes, the complexity of adolescent development outcomes, in particular, the complex uh, complexity of HIV sensitive social protection outcomes. Uh, Thank Tia, you we'll so we'll much for the you. Thank you so much for the question. I think what you're mentioning is really underscoring the need for complementary evaluation approaches. So for example, we don't even we don't just need quantitative impact evaluations, whether those be RCTs or quasi-experimental methods, which we've all been engaged in, but also qualitative methods to try to understand those pathways of impacts. And also I think increasingly the importance of process evaluations are being recognized. So these don't try to tell us what are the impacts, but they try to tell us how was the intervention implemented? Because we often have a very nice program design, but how that gets implemented in practice is gonna have a huge impact on the effects that we see in an impact evaluation. So we need to understand how do the different players understand the program objectives, the program design, how do they understand their roles and responsibilities? How are they communicating with participants? All of these are really important to try to understand why we did or why we didn't see impacts. In addition to process evaluations to just more broadly understanding the social protection impacts, I think the topic that you mentioned about nutrition, which is very important for HIV outcomes, Nutrition is a very complex outcome. If we just think about stunting among children, nutrition experts don't understand a significant portion of what determines stunting. So to be able to say why or why not one intervention affects stunting is really challenging. The determinants are very complex. So the interventions have to be very complex. And so we not only need to understand what are the impacts of social protection programs and cash plus programs, but increasingly, I think we need to understand what are the contextual factors? What are the quality and access to health services and how do those moderate the program impacts? Over. Great, thank you. Um, we'll go over to Juan Gonzalo and Michael Smith. Yes, I, I think, you know, Tia has really covered this quite well, but we see one, that one of the key problems uh, to you know, really build that synergy between social protection and public health systems is lack of political will. So this is important evidence that, that supports kind of like in the design and implementation of programs that are that need to be sort of complex in nature to address such complex and issues. But what I see often uh, that we need in terms of evidence here is a kind of a return of investment that shows um, you know, policymakers, how is it that we are achieving greater results by the fact that we are um, bringing this, this two systems together and those investments are needed. Um, and, I, and I think that we don't have a good uh, solid base and it's also methodologically quite difficult um, to, to, to reach um, a, a, a figure um, that, that, that is as compelling as we need and want. Over. Great. Michael, is it okay if I come in quickly? Sure, sure definitely. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's sort of two things for me. Um, I, I like Tia's kind of response in this kind of broad sense of all the information we have at our disposal. 
and Michael, you yourself, Rachel, um, were sort of pioneers on the state of the evidence of, of HIV sensitive social protection back in 2012. Um, and so why are we still kind of um, fighting to tell our story? And I think one thing that, that our sort of EpiSmart framework attempt shows that you kind of have to just sort of mash these pieces together. Um, and we've had conversations with, with Lucy and other collaborators where you go, you step back and say, well, maybe this was kind of obvious. Well, if that's so, how come no one has, has really done it? Um, I think it's sort of two things. And I, I mentioned it in my presentation. One is that, um, you know, the HIV world is not speaking to the social protection world and the social protection policy practitioners. Um, I think the other piece is that HIV in, in the last decade specifically has just really fallen off of every development agenda um, that, that it was once very high on. So we have to kind of keep fighting and banging the drum on this in terms of relevance. I think the other piece that, that Juan Gonzalo rightly highlights is the return on investment. And I'd even take it a step further um, is, is the scalability and the scale up of these interventions. Um, just from a WFP perspective, a lot of our single year, you know, layered pilot programs that look incredible on paper um, happen for 12, maybe 24 months. And that's the end of the story. Lucy, Tia have highlighted um, Cash Plus and these multiple layers of phased and sequenced approaches that are incredibly successful. Um, and yet when we hear from the Global Fund as to why social protection is not prioritized in a, in a global agenda around financing, um, we hear that's because they're not so sure on the scalability. So we just kind of have to keep fighting and coming up with creative and impactful ways to, to tell this story and, and make it um, not negotiable for people to understand that, that social protection and HIV agendas need to be addressed in concert together. Over. Great, thank you. Um, Lucy and Rachel? I mean, maybe just to come in on that point with the Global Fund and just in the, also in defense of the Global Fund as well. I mean, I think one of the challenges is that a lot of the economic strengthening money that sits under HIV is actually quite limited compared to the other needs obviously around sort of treatment uh, and prevention. And in my mind, I think we have to think of some of this HIV funding as catalytic and how we can use that funding in a more catalytic way to build off these much, much bigger social protection investments and thinking maybe what is the plus element to the cash or what is the adaptation or the tweak when we're going back to those sort of piggybacking models that can actually make the programs more inclusive and more responsive. So I think that there are sort of, I totally agree though with Michael that these conversations need to happen between health and social development ministries. And I think that's a big challenge going forward. Um, but over to Lucy. Um, this is this has been really um, amazing to hear and, um, and I'm hoping there'll be a recording so I can, I can listen again. But one of the things that occurs to me is that, um, and maybe a mistake that we made in the first years of, of HIV sensitive social protection was that we focused so narrowly on our HIV outcomes, or on, on specific HIV outcomes. And I had a, a really um, sort of startling moment, and I don't know if Delia remembers this, but we went out for coffee in, um, in Oxford. And Delia asked me, why are you looking at, why do you all focus on HIV and not on TB? which is so closely aligned. And it really made me realize that we are, um, we're, we're often so focused on these single outcomes that almost the biggest barrier is that you have to want to look at and care about multiple outcomes. You know, HIV, TB, um, sexual violence, education, which all themselves do feed into HIV outcomes, but which, which we have to push ourselves to, to look out of these single outcome focuses. And that's true for academics, it's true for policymakers, and it's true for big donors as well, which, which are often very focused. And perhaps to end on a, on a final nerdy um, thing, we had exactly the same question about, um, about confounders and how do you account for the fact that all of these outcomes are interrelated as well? And so we had a set of brilliant statisticians work on this for the last three years. And we have got now a really robust multi-level modeling approach and all of, our, all of our code is up for free and available to be shared. So if anyone feels a need to dive into um, weeks of complicated statistics, it is absolutely doable and we've got it and you can cut and paste it in.
Um, so we're, if we can move beyond the desire, we can now do it. Uh, that's really great to hear, Lucy. I know we're pushing a bit for time, but there's one more question that, that integrates a few comments on the chat. Um, all, all this focus on complexity, on integrating instruments as Juan Gonzalo and, and Michael Smith identified in the kind of comprehensive multiple outcomes that you, Lucy and Rachel have just described, really focus on the need for partnership. No one agency, no one government ministry can do this all. Um, and Juan Gonzalo, I, I see your work is really um, in WFP building partnerships. And Rachel and Lucy, this is where you've really succeeded in the work you've done. And yet it is the hardest thing to do. I can tell you stories about how people have said, don't even talk about ministries working together. It will never happen. You make it happen. Um, I, I think one of the most critical steps is being able to get that intersectoral cooperation. Um, can you comment on how this happens and how you get this to work? Um, maybe Rachel, given your role, maybe let's start with you and go in reverse order. Um, now there's a question. Um, it's, yeah, I think this is something that, um, and also just not just in the social protection field, but also when you think of programs around adolescent girls more broadly, you know, how do you develop, develop these sort of comprehensive um, interventions? And I think there are lessons to be learned about programs that are doing this at scale. I mean, some of the um, you know, the Ujana Salama program. Um, I mean, Tia might be able to say more about that, but you have a, a fundamentally social protection program with TASAF where you've layered on different interventions with a sort of HIV focus. I obviously don't know the details of how those interministerial conversations took place, but I think there's a good example of programs that, that have um, really brought these interventions to scale. Um, and I think it is also really sort of showing what the joint win is, you know, that these some of these accelerator type approaches, cash and parenting, can be multiple wins across sectors. And then through that, really trying to foster the collaboration. Great. Well, Lucy, do you want to add anything? I don't know. No. <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't know how we do it. And I mean, I think some of the Chris Desmond has been doing some really good thinking about whether there could be financial incentives within national systems, particularly coming from centralized treasury. But wow, this is this is the next nut to crack, isn't it? Well, I'd love to hear, I'd I'm love always to hear. noting what one of your final slides in your PowerPoint is often all the partnerships you've built and and all the people that you get to work together. So yeah, I think that is really at, at the heart of success for these kinds of complex interventions. Great, uh, Juan Gonzalo, Michael Smith, over to you for your thoughts. Yeah, I think, you know, I'm just gonna try to bring a concept here, which I find really, really interesting and very useful when thinking of partnerships. And, and ensuring that those ministries that would never work together, work together. And it's a, a concept by Danny Roderick from Harvard, which is this incentive compatibility, right? And how do you ensure, and I think here, the role of evidence, and this ties very well with what we're doing is creating that evidence that is, uh, that is appealing to both sectors. And I would echo what Michael has said, which is the, the key problem we see and, and the value of this sort of uh, learning sessions that bring together different actors is that people don't speak their, their different languages. They speak their own language and it's very difficult to make HIV public health experts to speak the social protection language and, and, and so on. So we need sort of evidence that brings those, that, that, those, those wins that are mutually beneficial and reinforcing uh, to the forefront in order to build that incentive compatibility. Right, so it's financial, so it's programmatic, um, and and it's political in nature. Thank you. Great, thank you, Michael. Yeah, and I would just quickly add. I think even when you are speaking um, what's meant to be the same language, it's also very difficult. Um, and I would, you know, provide the evidence of of getting social protection um, squarely into the new global aid strategy, right? Where you think you're kind of all in the same space in a supportive environment, talking the same.
the same language and it's still difficult. Um, and, and I think we were successful there employing some of the tactics that, that Lucy has been so successful at in her group um, in, in, in bringing kind of everyone willing to the table, academics, NGOs, civil society, of course, UN entities, um, and, and kind of forcing that conversation and not allowing, um, you know, to kind of be, to be swayed by a difficult context. I think one other thing I would add is that um, from sort of the interagency perspective of, of WFP, I think um, broadening your relationships a little bit, and, and of course, not just linking up with our kind of major social protection players like the ILO and UNICEF, um, but bringing someone to the table that does have some sway with governments and, and ministers and someone like UNDP and saying, hey, you know, this is a coalition of the willing. Um, let's not get hung up on, on, on sort of perfection. Let's get good enough and let's get some traction. Let's get some momentum. So those are a couple of the things that some of the tactics we've had to employ to be, I would argue, marginally successful uh, recently. Over. Great. Thank you, Michael. And, and Tia, do you have any comments on this? Yeah, so I think one way we can think about how to make the sectors work together is think more about not just how do we build one intersectoral program that can be, you know, implemented in a silo or, you know, onto another program, but how do we build stronger linkages between existing programs and existing systems. And I think sometimes we have good intentions around that, but sometimes the focus is still too technical or still too what is the ideal design. So for example, management information systems are really important for identifying participants of programs who might be eligible for other programs, but sometimes our focus on that is still at a very technical level. And one area that I think is very overlooked is how do we strengthen the capacity of people who implement those linkages in practice. I think social workers and case management is really key to these intersectoral link linkages between existing programs and services and something that we just don't talk enough about. Thank, thank you, Tia, that's very important. And, and yeah, the vital role that good case management can play in these processes has been demonstrated over and over again. Um, I'll just ask each of the presenters to, for a one sentence key message takeaway in a second. Um, but, but I want to highlight a theme that's happened that, that's come up a few times here in the challenges. It's, it's difficult enough when the different stakeholders speak different languages, use different jargon. But when we look at HIV sensitive social protection, um, people in HIV and HIV and AIDS world and people in the social protection world speak the same language, but the words mean different things. Uh, vulnerability, for example. And, mm -hmm. and this is one of the things that requires greater communication. Um, and as we look at the past pandemic over the past two years, it's really highlighted the value that a more epi smart social protection framework could offer um, in, in a crisis that has cost countless trillions of dollars, a tiny fraction of that loss invested preemptively could have made such a huge difference. And this is the challenge for this research that this is about tackling all the vital shocks and working to achieve a comprehensive portfolio of outcomes. Um, and, and with that view, let me ask um, Tia, let's perhaps start with you just uh, your one sentence takeaway for today, what, what's the one key message you'd really wanna highlight for the group before we conclude? Social protection like cash transfers can have really positive impacts on health and well-being, but we need to take into consideration contextual factors such as prevailing gender norms, quality of health services, and think about how we can link people to address some of those related vulnerabilities and who are the key players implementing those linkages. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Juan Gonzalo. Yeah, thank you. I would say look beyond the tree to see the forest. Uh, we are living in a syndemic world and maybe having a narrow focus on HIV may, 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 may make us lose opportunities to, to advance, you know, those systemic synergies that are very much needed between social protection and, and public health. Great, thank you. Uh, Michael, 
Yeah, and just building off of that, I think it's important to equally prioritize social protection and public health um, and, and use the focus of, of each area to complement the other. You know, use social protections, focus on um, social and, and, and economic impacts to strengthen, you know, public health's role in focusing on health and, and try to link those up um, as coherently as possible. Thanks. Great. No, thank you. Rachel. Um, I would say I think we have come a long way in building the evidence, um, a lot of new evidence since 2012 and the first review uh, that Michael led on. Um, I think, as Tio is mentioning, we need to now make sure that these approaches are more contextualized and more age and gender responsive. Great, thank you. And Lucy, the final word. Cash plus care works and governments and international agencies can do it. Wonderful, a very positive concluding, um, fitting for a call to action. Thank you. Um, Tia, Juan Gonzalo, Michael, Rachel, Lucy, thank you. These have been inspiring presentations, uh, really energizing, and we're looking forward to them having a great impact. And to all the participants in the webinar, thank you for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you again at the next global webinar. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you Thanks for the extra 12 minutes. We, we appreciate your patience. Thank you. The impact of content here. Thank you.